I'm really delighted to be able to share my work with you today. And as Marian said, I'm a physician. I'm not a dentist. And actually, as a physician, uh, in my training in medicine and pediatrics, I was taught to uh, look in the children's mouth and ignore the teeth and just look at the back of the throat and the tonsils. But when I started seeing this, it caught my eye. And I couldn't ignore it. And then I started hearing from parents that their children were suffering from mouth pain. And I realized that this is something that is so critical to children's overall health, their nutrition, their educational potential, and their future. So this has been my focus over the recent years. So I want to start actually 35 years ago when I started working in global health in Latin America. After I graduated from college, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador. And I lived and worked in a rural area. That's actually me in the 1970s. Uh, and in this rural area, the people were very poor, and they had all of the health problems associated with poverty. There was diarrheal disease, respiratory disease, uh, skin infections. Uh, but I do want it to, you to take a look at the teeth. What do you see there? Beautiful teeth. It just wasn't an issue back then. Uh, the people just ate straight from the farm. Fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, meat, eggs, milk. And they only rarely had soda or candy. But then 20 years later, when I returned to work in Latin America, uh, actually in El Salvador, I had seen that the market, this was the old market, and then these are the new markets, selling all this processed and sugary foods and drinks, and in huge volumes. And I started looking in the newspaper, and as Marion described the quarterly reports in the business section, they described how uh, beverage sales uh, were dipping in the United States. And what was happening, all of the beverage and junk food companies were shifting their market into the developing world, which they call emerging markets. And the marketing was working. This is what I saw when I arrived in El Salvador in the early 2000s. Kids were constantly snacking on junk food. This is actually how they showed up for their dental exams. You know, holding chips, lollipops, sweetened drinks. And you can see in the background their mothers are obese as well. And I had never seen this before, this severe tooth decay. Actually, this is a three-year-old child. And these teeth there, they're decayed all the way down. There's the pulp sticking out there, which is where the nerve is. This is excruciatingly painful for the children. So I started asking around to the people, and the grandmothers all told me that the young people have moved away from our traditional foods. Now they just eat sweets. And I realized the way they were bemoaning this, it wasn't just a loss of nutrition, it was a loss of the culture as well. And Tom Carlson talked about that this morning. Uh, the fathers told me, I grew up poor, I just want to give my children a treat whenever I can. So when they had a little extra money in their pocket, they'd go to the store and buy their children a soda or some junk food. And the mothers were all telling me, my children's teeth are rotten. They complain of pain all the time. They can't eat, they can't sleep, they can't play, and they can't concentrate in school. So I realized, I'm not a dentist, but as a physician... As a public health expert and as a mother, this is something that is so critical to children's health and well-being and their whole future. So I had to go to the literature and learn about uh, dental disease. I hadn't learned about that in my training. I learned that it's called early childhood caries, tooth decay in children under age six. And in Early childhood caries is the most common chronic disease of childhood worldwide. 60 to 95% of children have early childhood caries. How can this be the most common chronic disease of childhood? And I had never learned about it in my medical training in pediatrics and public health. It is so neglected. I found that there's different prevalence and severity within and between countries. Even here in the Bay Area, we have a tremendous two- or three-fold difference in the prevalence and severity of tooth decay, which actually follows the same color map that Preston showed uh, 
where the map of obesity and diabetes in our Bay Area. Uh, and there have been changing rates over recent decades. High income countries like the United States and Europe had seen a reduction, but actually now the rates of tooth decay are going up again in our country. And low and middle income countries have had steady increases in tooth decay over recent decades. And in the dental literature, actually, there are many studies that show that there are associations between severe tooth decay and malnutrition, anemia, and even obesity. It's a complex relationship whether tooth decay is going to go to malnutrition or obesity depends on socioeconomic status, how involved mouth pain is, the family's access to food. So it's very complicated, but there's lots of literature showing the association between tooth decay and malnutrition on both sides. However, when I went to the public health, the global public health literature, the literature was virtually silent on this issue. In 2008-2013, Lancet published comprehensive reviews on child malnutrition. Also, UNICEF, Save the Children, had reports on malnutrition, and they talked about how lack of food, calories, protein, micronutrients, and infectious diseases can cause malnutrition. But there was not one mention of junk food leading to tooth decay and mouth pain contributing to malnutrition. There was not one mention of mouth pain contributing to malnutrition. Now, how could that be? The mouth is at the beginning of the alimentary tract. Actually, there was a lot of discussion about diarrhea, the other end of the alimentary tract being associated with malnutrition, but not one mention of mouth pain contributing to malnutrition. This is a tremendous gap. Looking on the obesity and junk food side, uh, the WHO had recommendations essentially against the advertising of junk food uh, to children, and they talked about all the hazards of junk food leading to obesity, hypertension, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and even cancer, known as the non-communicable diseases, or NCDs. There was not one mention of tooth decay as a result of the same junk food. So somehow our public health community is not seeing oral health. So I actually had to learn about the causes of tooth decay, which I didn't know. I learned that it was an infectious disease. How many of you knew that? Okay. So uh, still a small proportion. And the bacteria metabolizes a substrate. I think we have an idea what that's going to be. And there are host factors in the child's teeth that affect uh, this disease. So the bacteria, uh, there are many bacteria, but strep mutans is the most common one. It hangs out on the teeth in that sticky bacterial plaque that is formed, and this bacteria is transmitted from the mother's mouth to the child's mouth. Uh, what does the bacteria like to metabolize or eat? Uh, sugary, processed, and carbohydrate foods. So all the foods that you saw those children carrying there, uh, that's what the bacteria is loving to eat. Also, the sugars in juice, soda, and even milk. Uh, acidic foods and drinks are most harmful in, in decaying the teeth as well. And the baby bottle is particularly problematic. If there are sugary drinks in the baby bottle, and especially if the child is put to bed with the baby bottle in the mouth, and then there's continual contact for a prolonged period of time. Also, continual snacking then is basically feeding the bacteria uh, and contributing to the exacerbation of the problem. So what happens? The bacteria metabolizes the sugars and produces acid as a waste product, and then that decays the teeth. It demineralizes the teeth. And there are factors associated with uh, the child's underlying health that make the child more susceptible to tooth decay, especially poor tooth structure from poor prenatal or child nutrition, especially lack of calcium and fluoride, and then, of course, not brushing your teeth and not getting dental care. So this is actually a simplified version that uh, we created for low literacy audiences. This shows that there are bacteria in our mouth that we can't actually see when uh, sugars come into the mouth, either like in candy or sodas. The bacteria eat them and then produce the acid as the waste product. Then the acid is like burning the teeth and causes tooth decay. I do want to say something. We talked about the microbiome. You can actually see there's pus coming out of that child's gums. 
Uh, it would be very interesting to, to study the microbiome and the impact of chronic infection and chronic inflammation. You come close to these children and you can smell the decay. And the other children don't even want to sit next to these children in school because there's so much chronic infection there. This is another way of looking at it, more of a clinical version. It's called the Carey's Balance, looking at the balance of pathological factors and protective factors. And in recent years, as we've had more pathological factors pushing towards Carey's, we need to have more of the protective factors pushing away from Carey's. And then this is more of a public health model, the ecological model. And you can see here, there, there's the microbiologic model too. But then there are influences at the child level, how much junk food the child is eating, uh, whether the child's brushing the teeth. There are family level influences like socioeconomic status and uh, how much healthy food versus junk food they have at home, whether they have dental care. And then there are community level influences as well, like access to healthy food uh, versus uh, junk food. So for caries prevention, it's actually pretty simple, and the experts say that this is a disease that's 100% preventable by good nutrition and good oral hygiene. Basically, you just have to hit each of the parts. You've got to brush your teeth and get dental checkups and treatment to try to remove the heavy load of the microorganisms. You have to breastfeed and give children healthy food and limit the baby bottle and junk food and sugary drinks to basically stop feeding the microorganisms. And then to strengthen the children's teeth, drinking milk and fluoride. Pretty simple. So I'm particularly interested in the connection between severe tooth decay and malnutrition. And this is my hypothesis. We know that poor oral hygiene and poor diet lead to tooth decay. Uh, that's causing destruction of the teeth, mouth pain, and chronic inflammation. And uh, my hypothesis is that this is leading to malnutrition. So then I want to see whether we can prevent this cycle uh, by having good oral hygiene, good diet, leading to less tooth decay, less problems there, and less malnutrition. So this is uh, the guiding hypothesis for the intervention that I'm going to share with you. Uh, starting in 2004 with one of my medical students here, uh, we did a study in El Salvador in collaboration with the Salvadoran NGO looking at children six months through six years of age in a rural area to look at the prevalence and causes of tooth decay, the association between tooth decay and malnutrition. Of course, this is what all the mothers were telling me, but nobody had studied it there. And then to see if we could develop an intervention to reduce tooth decay and improve children's nutrition and health. The study designs and methods, this was a community-based participatory intervention. We just had a pre-post intervention design longitudinal study. We we're looking at the, all the children in the 12 villages where their community health workers worked. Uh, and over time, we had about 1,800 children, 1,000 mothers. And we took a team down to collect data every year by interviewing the mothers, examining the children, a dentist would examine, uh, do the dental exam, and we measured height and weight for nutritional status. Here were our baseline findings. We found that 85% of the children had tooth decay, almost half had mouth pain, and 20% of the children were malnourished. The contributing factors were what we knew uh, from the literature. Uh, do you think this is a little problem or a big problem? Huge. This is a huge problem. So we started the intervention. Uh, first, nutrition education and oral health in, uh, education for the community health workers who in turn educated the children and parents. Next, we provided free toothbrushes and toothpaste for all family members, not just for the children because this is a family disease, and we certainly didn't want to give one toothbrush that would be passed around the family, spreading the germs, and, and it's really important for the parents to model good oral hygiene as well. Uh, we trained the health workers to apply fluoride varnish to their children's teeth three times a year, and I'll say a little about fluoride varnish. And then we provided referrals to dental care for the children with tooth decay. So we weren't providing dental care ourselves. We weren't providing food. We weren't providing micronutrients. We were just doing oral health promotion. So a little about fluoride varnish. Uh, fluoride is something that's been shown to be very effective. It strengthens the teeth. And the varnish has been shown in uh, multiple studies to cut tooth decay by half or even more. 
It's proven and safe. There's over 40 years of use in Europe, Scandinavia, and the United States. It just hasn't been used in the developing world much, uh, but it's really uh, easy to use, and it should be used more. Uh, very easy to apply. It's just painted on the teeth. It takes a minute. No pain. We tell the health workers, if you can paint your fingernails, you can learn to paint children's teeth. Very easy. Doesn't require any refrigeration, special equipment. Very easy to use in low resource settings. And it's inexpensive. We pay about 80 cents per dose two or three times a year, but it can be bought in uh, larger volumes for a lot cheaper as well. So I want to share with you some of the preliminary results. First of all, we have many, many limitations. I've had no funding for this study. All volunteer researchers, I've had uh, 200 volunteers working with me on this so far, and some of them are in the room today. Thank you very much. Uh, we had intervention villages only, no controls. Our intervention reached a larger number of children in the communities, but only about half could show up on the day of our exam. So this is just a pilot study. I'm going to show you just some preliminary results. We really need further data analysis and a rigorous study done of this. First, I want to show you a profile of our entire study population, just looking at tooth decay and mouth pain. So this is tooth decay by child's age. And the DMFT, when the dentists examine the children's teeth, they say for each tooth, is it not erupted yet? If it is erupted, is it healthy or is it decayed? And, uh, uh, and then is it missing because usually extracted because of decay or filled because of decay? So the decay, missing and filled teeth is like the burden of tooth decay. And uh, I don't know if you know how many baby teeth children have. They have up to 20 baby teeth. Uh, so this on the y-axis is the, the number of de uh, decay, missing, filled teeth, and this is the age of the child. And you can see when children are born, no teeth and no decay. Uh, the teeth start coming in around six months of age, no decay yet. But you can see even in the first year of life and two years of life, we're already starting in with the decay. And after about four years of age, there's a really dramatic increase in decay. So that by the time the children are six to eight years of age entering school, they have on the average 10 or half of their teeth decayed. That's very substantial. This is looking at reports of oral pain uh, by the decay, missing, and filled teeth. We have a question in our survey to the mother, how often does your child complain of mouth pain? And the answer could be either never, occasionally, frequently, or almost always. And you can see here, this is the percentage of children who are reported to have pain, and this is the DMFT grouped. And you can see, even when children don't have any decayed teeth, occasionally they'll complain of mouth pain uh, from normal teething or some mouth infection, but it's pretty low, maybe about 7%. And even with one to four decayed teeth, there's pretty low rate of mouth pain, but once you get up to five to nine decayed teeth, we have over 40% are complaining of mouth pain. And once you're 10 or more, we have over 65% of the children complaining of mouth pain. So again, when the kids are entering school at age six, they're in that last column there. Most of them are complaining of mouth pain. I want to show you just some selected outcomes, knowledge and malnutrition and obesity by weight for age. Uh, so we're doing a lot of education. We want to see whether the mothers are learning about the causes of tooth decay. And we have just an open-ended question in our interview. What do you think causes tooth decay? And when we started, very few knew. And then over time, they had increased in knowledge that candy, sugary drinks, and not brushing the teeth caused tooth decay. I do want to point out that still there's a very low knowledge that sugary drinks are causing tooth decay, and that is because... We're trying to fight against those billions of dollars that are going into the advertising of sugary drinks saying that it's healthy for children, that it opens happiness. Uh, so, so this is our major challenge there. And then a quick look at obesity and malnutrition. Uh, so this is the blue line is malnutrition. When we started, about 20% of our children were malnourished, and by 2010, it was down to 5%. And I was concerned, ooh, is this the beginning of the obesity crisis coming in? Are they just shifting from malnourished through normal towards obese? But actually, we kept obesity also at a low rate, which is very exciting. Some of our success stories from El Salvador. And then we extended the project to other countries. 
So these are some of the countries where we're working all around the world. Unfortunately, we're seeing the same thing with the prevalence of junk food and severe tooth decay, even in the most remote regions. I just want to quickly show you some of our baseline data to show you that this is a problem all over the world. I'll show you from three different regions, Ecuador, Vietnam, and Nepal, and you can see we have a substantial number of children and families uh, that we're drawing our data from. Uh, so this is looking at risk factors for tooth decay. A bottle feeding, of course, is not the traditional practice, but it has really moved into the developing world, and especially you can see Vietnam stands out by having a very high rate of bottle feeding. Uh, the average time to walk to, to, from home to junk, junk food store uh, is really pretty short all across the board. Think how long it takes to walk from your home to, buy, to the store where you can buy junk food. In Vietnam, it's five minutes. Uh, in Nepal, kids are eating candy on the average every day. Uh, here's a concern about oral health that mothers, many mothers are not brushing their children's teeth, especially in Ecuador and Nepal. And uh, the dentists say the children actually need an adult to help them brush their teeth up to six to eight years of age. So this is really critical. And then I want to point out that while our children have oral health problems, the mothers as well are suffering across the board from oral health problems. And this is a family illness that we're dealing with. This is our oral health and nutrition status. The top line, child has tooth decay, very high across the board. Again, the majority of children are suffering from this. A uh, high number of decayed teeth, a uh, large number of children complaining of pain, and uh, we're finding high rates of stunting nutrition, especially in Ecuador and Nepal, and overweight obesity in Vietnam. So there are some similarities and differences across our regions. So in conclusion, we have this global pandemic, tooth decay associated with malnutrition and obesity. It's affecting the majority of children. We have serious consequences, mouth pain, infection, malnutrition, and I'm concerned about the children's development and their future educational potential. And we have effective and expensive interventions. We spend less than $5 per child per year. I want to show this because I feel like we have three child health pandemics, the tooth decay, malnutrition, and obesity, all connected by the processed foods and drinks. And an intervention directed at that center problem could hopefully reduce all of those pandemics. I want to show that the costs of tooth decay on the left are so much more than the costs of preventing tooth decay. And we have a new opportunity for improving child nutrition. So we've had this long-standing global problem of child nutrition. We need to start thinking outside of the box and bring new interventions. We need to bring the mouth back into the body and see oral health as critical to children's nutrition and overall health. It's an important global health issue, and we need to focus both on prevention, and again, this is a family, a maternal child health issue, and access to dental care. This is our biggest challenge, as Marion showed this morning, uh, the advertisement of junk food. We did uh, a little review of the ads in Nepal and India when we were there this year, and these are the themes that were used to advertise the junk food. It definitely appeals to what poor and uneducated people want for their children. I think this is taking advantage of people. And I do want to say something about India. Uh, because this was my first time visiting India, and India is said to have one in three of the malnourished children in the world. Uh, but we found the same problem with the increase in junk food consumption. And this is something that a health worker and a nutritionist told me. We have some families who, because of the very low cost and convenience, give their children a candy for breakfast, a chocolate for lunch, and a bag of chips for dinner. That's all they may eat all day. And then the nutritionist said, I believe that junk food is becoming the greatest threat to child nutrition in India. So we need oral health promotion and we need global nutrition advocacy and regulations. We need to ensure truth in advertising, limit children's access to cheap, unhealthy food, and increase children's access to affordable, healthy food and clean water. And I want to leave you with a statement 
from one of the Salvadoran mothers whose children participated in our intervention from birth and they're cavity free. Actually, here's a poster of all of our cavity free children from the communities. And she said, we used to think there was nothing we could do about our children's rotten teeth and mouth pain. It was just a fact of life here. But now, childhood doesn't have to be a time of pain and malnutrition. It can be a time of good health and happiness. This is what I believe all children in the world deserve. And I believe that it is possible. And I want to work with all of you to make this happen. Thank you.